The main idea for the sermon today is it's called the Lord Abides. And the Lord abides in all of these different places. He abides in our mess. He abides in us in all places. He has made a home with us and he abides with us. But oftentimes we go after other places and we abide in other things and that creates kind of a mess. Now we're on to like the actual thing here. Um, what... I was about to say one of my favorite TV shows, but in all honesty, I think it is my favorite TV show, and it's called Rev. Have you guys ever heard of this show before? It's fitting that, you know, that's because it's a reverend, right? But it's uh, the reason why you've never heard it before is because it's on the BBC. It's on the BBC. Uh, if you would like to watch the show, it's on Hulu in the United States. Some of you are like, what is Hulu? Hulu is an online streaming, kind of like Netflix, but um, more TV shows than Netflix. And uh, but it's but it's on Hulu on there. And this this show it's about uh, this priest. His name is Adam Smallbone, and he is the vicar. He's the priest. They call him vicars in London. He's the vicar of Saint Saviors, and it's this small urban church that is falling apart. He regularly preaches in front of just 20 people, which looks like nothing in this massive chapel of the church that had a glorious past, right? And he's just trying to figure out how to enliven this church church, but the world just keeps knocking him down, right? He tries to feed the poor and, and care for people, but it just keeps knocking him down. He keeps finding all these issues, and he just has problems. And I have a clip from the show, and it'll show you what I mean. Like this guy, he tries and tries and tries, and he just keeps getting knocked down and knocked down and knocked down. And I have a clip here. Uh, to quick set up the clip, it, it'll, it'll do its own thing. There's a guy running around London impersonating a vicar, impersonating a priest, all right? And so that's the beginning of the clip. Excuse me, sir. Can I have a word? Yes, officer. Are you a vicar? Uh, yes. <laughs> Can you prove it, please? Got any ID? Well, no, but um, I, I am a vicar. Are you a policeman? <laughs> yes, I can confirm that this is Adam Smallbone, the one and only much cherished and respected vicar of St. Saviour's. Can I ask you to carry some ID in future, please? Is it actually illegal to impersonate a vicar? Uh, well, it's certainly wrong. Adam's been doing it for years. <laughs> <laughs> Just a joke. <laughs> so, you get an idea of the show. The uh, and the show is brilliantly written. It, it's it's this comedy, but it's got this biting touch because this episode. This is uh, uh, there's only like six or seven episodes in a season. This is season one, episode six. And what he's going through is he's feeling very inadequate for the job of of being the vicar at this church. He's feeling very inadequate towards it. He's not sure if he can do it right. And there's this guy running around London who's in person impersonating a vicar. You get it? He feels like he's impersonating a vicar and he gets he keeps on being pulled over by the police asking if he's a real vicar. You know, and it's his own existential crisis that he's having, right? But at the end of the game, he's, he, he keeps on kind of going down. He's at a party. He drinks way too much at a party, right? He drinks way too much, ends up getting kicked out of the party for various reasons, and he's just wandering around the streets of London, you know, kind of drunk and yelling at garbage cans and stuff like that. And, and then the priest come up, the, the priest, the police come up to him again, and they're like, are you the vicar? And he's like, yes, I'm the vicar. Like, he kept on asking me this. And he's, I'm the vicar. And he shows them an ID, and he's like, they're like, get in the car. And, you know, and he thinks they're, they're pulling him over for an intoxication and all that. And they take him over to one of his members' homes. And she's dying, and she wants last rites. And he then quotes Isaiah chapter 9. And the Lord said, who shall I send? 
Here am I, send me. Yeah, right? Yeah. The show's incredible. Incredible. And I'll invite, you can talk to me or Coley if you'd like to, but if you would like to watch episodes of Rev with Coley and I, we love, we, so we love this show. But you got to come and talk to us about it. Maybe we'll have a little group that watches through these. But I have to say this. I have to give you a warning. It's British TV. It's not American TV. You got to put your big boy pants on and big girl pants. All right? You can't just, because the clips are edited a little bit. All right? For church. <laughs> There's nothing bad about them. But I like my job, and I, probably, I might not have one if I had shown the full clip. But, but yeah, it that show's amazing because it shows it shows really well this guy who's trying so hard. He's trying so hard, and he's trying to make his home in all these different places. He's trying to be part of the dance of God. He's trying to abide where God is, but he just the life just ends up becoming a mess all around him. Like this, this is what, what John is talking about, and we'll, we'll get into it right here with our verse. It's 1 John 2.18, and this verse is odd and bizarre, okay? It says, children... It is the last hour, as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. You read that and you're like, what? What is Antichrist? What's going on? Is Tim LaHaye in the room? Like, like you just, no one knows who Tim LaHaye is. That's all right. The, it's like the guy who wrote the Left Behind books. Is he in the room type of thing? Like, it's, it's like, what's going on? Every commentary, every theologian that I read concerning this section of, of verses, they said the problem here is that Antichrist doesn't mean what it used to. It's almost better to use the word anti-Messiah now. See, Messiah and Christ is actually the same word. One is Hebrew, one is Greek. In English, it means king or anointed one. Okay? So that's, that's, that's what it means. So kind of the anointed one. And so what he's saying here is that there are anti-Messiahs, anti-Christ, these, these, and they're pulling you away from the hope that you know. They're pulling you away from it. And what he's talking about in 1 John chapter 2, he's talking about this, this heresy that's really well known. It was like the first major church heresy. It's called Gnosticism. Have you guys ever heard of Gnosticism before? Yeah, the main idea in Gnosticism is that you could get your head into the right place where you're thinking just of godly things and all of that, and then you would be able to shed your sinful physical body and ascend to the glories on high. Right? That's, that's something we say a lot, a lot of times. We still struggle with Gnosticism to this day. Because I, I, I've heard people say a, a lot that it's like, well, at least they're talking about someone that had just died or something like that. And at least they've shed that sinful body and now they can go into heaven. Right? But your body is not sinful. It's created by God. And that's why yes, last week we talked about what John, he, he said the physical actions of God is here. And he's now he's pointing out, he says that there are antichrists, there's anti-messiahs that are pulling you away from this hope that you've known and is trying to put you somewhere else. And he's saying, but God abides with you. And this happens in our own day and time. Like we, we do this all the time where, where we put our hope and strength and security into all these little places around us. Like the, the big the big boogeyman is, and we've already picked out on it in the confession, but it's politics. We put up so much hope and security in politics to the point where when someone this is this is the litmus test. This is the litmus test. Are you ready? If someone messes with your candidate a little too strongly, or with your political position too a little strongly and you disagree with them, and you get angry, we might have sniffed out a false idol. 
<laughs> like that's no, everyone got real quiet right there. Because <laughs> we're like, oh, guilty, right? Like that's because I'm that same way. I'm the same way that I look at this modern political game and I'm like, if we can just elect the right person, then we will have safety, hope, and security. Right? And 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 Paul, uh, John is saying, no, that's a that's a that's an anti-messiah. He's pulling you away from that hope in Jesus. But we have other ones too. We have other ones too. We have like our work, or at least our, our work. Uh, like maybe some of you used to work like this, but like I've talked with people, and uh, I you know I used to be in a very corporate environment. And I, and I had people that would work 70, 80 hours a week. And I would talk to them. I was like, why do you work so much? And they had pretty much the same answer each time. It's my kids. My kids. And I'm just like, yeah, but you're not with your kids. You're not, you're not, you're not with them. You're working all this time. Now, I'm sure many of you or some of you in the room were that person that was working 70 and 80 hours a week, right? And now you're, you might be trying to repair some of those relationships with your kids. I don't know, but I have a feeling it might be. But that's, but, but we do that. We, we put our work, I, we also, like for many of you in the room, it's your retirement plans. You have all this safety and security. How many of you open up your, your computer browser and the sole reason why that thing gets flipped on every day, that computer gets flipped on, is so you can check Yahoo Finance or Google Finance or your Bloomberg report or something, <laughs> right? Like that's, like we, we all do that. I do that. It's like we, we got to look at it and it's like, ooh, I'm on a fixed income. I got to watch this. It's like, all right, the market's going up, you know, type of thing. Our hope and security is found in that. Listen, that stuff is good. You have to manage it. You have to have a job and all that stuff. But listen, your hope and security isn't found in that. That stuff could easily be blown away. But our security is found in Jesus. And there's all these things. We all have our parts where we put our hopes and securities in these other things. It's just true. It's what we do. And the problem is, as much like Rev, like my, our buddy Adam Smallbone, is that he, like, he sees this small dying church. He's trying to keep it alive. He's trying to abide where God is abiding and all these things. But he keeps just making a mess of it. And I think, I, like, I relate to that very strongly. Like, it's like, I just want to do this good thing over here, and it ends up just being a debacle or a mess, right? Or sometimes someone else's mess spills over into my life. That happens a lot too, doesn't it? Like someone else's life just spills over into you. Someone else's drama comes over into your house all of a sudden, right? Ever had that one friend that, that came over and it's like, oh, me and whoever just had the hugest fight. And suddenly you're involved in the mess. And, and we look around and we're just like, man, this mess is everywhere. I don't want it to be here, but it just is. It's everywhere around us, and we can feel it and sense it. And John is saying, it's like, those are the anti-Messiahs. They're pulling you away, but yeah, you're still going to be in a mess. And he's encouraging you to keep it simple. And that's what that, that's what that uh, poem is at the beginning of it. I've been not using any of my slides. But that's what that poem was in the middle there. And it's, it's a poem. We don't know if John wrote this poem or this song or if it was a, a popular song in the day. But it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a song, it's a song that has like it's ABC, ABC kind of pattern. And so the first, first three is, I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven. He's helping them get back in. It's like, don't worry about the mess that's all around you. Check, look, look, center yourselves again because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. And then he starts repeating. I'm writing to you children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. And then I write to you young men because you are strong 
and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. And when we skip forward about five verses, we get to verse 28 and it says, and now little children abide in him, abide in God, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence, not shrink from him in shame and his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you'll be sure that everyone who practices righteous will be born of him. Abide in him. It's like I realize that the, the world is, is in a mess, but he keeps encouraging us, abide in God. And when you continue reading more, you find out that he's talking about how God abides in us. How God abides in us. That God comes into the mess of our own lives. How we've tried to abide in him, and we're going to try, and, it's, and a lot of times, sometimes we may get it right. But sometimes we just end up creating a mess. But God always comes into the mess of our own lives. I mean, look at the Jesus' birth in the manger. That's messy, right? I think about how Jesus healed people. It wasn't from on high, like going down, it's like you were healed. Like he was down in the midst of their mess. Be healed. He wept with those who lost his friends. It's messy. And all the way to the cross, he took on all of our mess when he died on the cross and he rose again, leaving it all behind. It's a very, this chapter two of John is very interesting because he's at the same time, he's talking about, hey, come back, remember what you've been taught. Remember to live in the light of God. Remember to abide in Him. But at the same time, He's also saying, but the Lord abides in you. The Lord abides in you. And that brings us back to our friend, the Reverend Adam Smallbone. There's three, cha- there's three seasons in Rev. And each, as each season goes through and through each season, it gets darker and darker and darker as you start to see that he just cannot turn this church around. He's trying to do it well. He's trying to make sense of it. And he just can't turn it around. And, and it's gotten to the point where the, the church is right at the edge of foreclosure. It's about to close up his door. They're about to be evicted out of it. And he just doesn't know what to do. And, and, and he's also been accused of a crime. And even the lady in the gas station has, has told him, he's like, you're a dirty vicar. You're a nasty vicar. And, and he's just, he's gotten beaten up and people have graffitied the front of his house and it's all terrible. And this is all Holy Week. It's all before then. And he then, he has to take this cross across, across his little borough in London to another church. He has to take this cross and he grabs the cross out of his shed and he walks very tragically and comically at the same time, like those Jesus movies that you saw from the 70s with Jesus walking with the cross. And he walks through London and people are, you know, they're, they're talking down to him and all of that. And, and we kind of, he walks through the night and then in the morning he walks up onto a hill and that's where we'll pick up this next video. wherever you may be I am the Lord of the dance said he and I lead you all wherever you may be and I lead you all in the dance said he 
dance for the scribes and the Pharisees. They wouldn't dance, they would not follow me. So I danced for the fishermen, for James and John. They came with me, so the dance went on. Dance, dance, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all, wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. Dance, dance, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. And I'll lead you all, wherever you may be. And I'll lead you all in the dance, said he. Oh, I like your dancing. Yeah, thanks. You're in a good mood, then? Not really. Oh? Why's that, then? I'm trying to keep something alive, but I don't think I can do it. Oh. Uh, you know, I've learned a few things over the years. Oh, yes? You can't... You can't make an omelette without cracking some eggs. Right, thanks. It doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. I see. We are what we eat. Yep. You buy cheap, you buy twice. The open hand has the strongest grip. It's OK, you can stop now. Never parachute into an area you've just bombed. Well, that's a good one. Adam, Adam. We all have our crosses to bear. Yes, yes, we do. Understand, Adam. I'll always be here. Adam, where have you Go been? Again. Alex, I just met God. So dance, dance, wherever you may be. I am the Lord of the dance, said he. I'll lead you on wherever you may be. I'll lead you on in the dance, said he. That's God abiding with us. That in the midst of the mess and the frustration and in not knowing which way forward, we see God coming to us. I love the picture of that. It's that God is abiding with us. And we're abiding with him in the midst of the mess of it all. And he says, we all have our crosses to bear, right? And he says, I understand and I'm always with you. Love that show. That's not even the last episode. <laughs> it ends, it ends, I think, better than even Breaking Bad ended if you got into that show. But the Lord is abiding and we abide in him. And he gets it and he comes into our mess and he's there with us. So what does all of this have to do with love over words? It's simple that the Lord abides. The Lord abides with us in our mess. And, and John and Jesus, he's encouraging us to do the same. That our neighbors are going to be in a mess just like we are. It's just going to be a different mess. And we can abide with them because God abides with them. And we can show them love because God has shown us love. And rather than just going, ah, you got to change your life completely or something like that, we can go, the Lord loves you and he's with you. And we all have our crosses to bear, right? So may this encourage you in this week that you may be able to know that through whatever mess is thrown at you, that God is with you through it and he's seeing you in it. And may you be able to be the hands and feet of God and whatever your neighbor's mess is, that you may show him love 
and grace. Him or her will say that. Love and grace. And that's really, really good news. Amen.